Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. In our scripture today, Ephesians 2, uh, 1 through 10, we're reading a really interesting scripture where Paul takes the time to remind the church of what God has saved them from. But what's really weird is he has to bring up some really negative stuff about who they used to be, okay? But he's not saying that's who they are. He's just saying this is who you used to be. This used to be your, your identity, your destiny. It was bad, but good news is not like that because you believed. So the scripture we're going to read today is in past tense. He's talking to a church who's already believed in Jesus Christ, who has received this salvation. By the way, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 has been known as like a, a mini book of Romans because it covers the gospel and it covers um, in, 10, in 10 verses, it covers the good news of Jesus Christ in multiple chapters that Romans covers. So in just 10 verses, uh, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 covers a ton of what Romans, the book of Romans covers. And so they call it like a mini Romans. And this, this portion is a great scripture for you who may not understand what Jesus has done for you. And maybe you haven't even put your trust and faith and confidence in Christ yet. For us as believers, this is a great reminder today of what has been done for us. But it's also great for us who are disciple makers. Maybe you've made the, the decision to now help other people understand the gospel, understand what Jesus has done for them. And so you could help break the scripture down for people who have not yet believed, or maybe they're a brand new born believer, newborn believer, a young Christian, this would be a great scripture to teach. So this is really uh, applicable to everyone. And by the way, this, these 10 verses cover the scope of the entire Bible. It's, it's amazing. If you were to break down these verses, there would be hundreds of cross references connecting to so many different places in scripture. It's unbelievable. So I'm excited to get into this, and let's go ahead and go right into Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. It says this, once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. Remember, he's talking to the church here. You used to live in sin, just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger or wrath, just like everyone else. Now that is a scary portion of scripture to read. Here's why. In this scripture, we see five things that we are without Christ. Five pieces of identity or destiny or who, who we are, our realization of, of our condition. And the first one is we're spiritually dead. The word dead here isn't meaning like physical death. It's we're talking about spiritual death. If you're away from Christ, if you do not have Christ, your destination is you are still overpowered by sin. And yes, even physical death, eternal separation from God. That's the reality for anyone who does not have Christ. That's what Paul's saying. You used to be like that. You used to be spiritually dead. He's talking to the church. And then he says, you are following the ways of this world. Now, here's the thing. We all conform to something. We all conform. We can't help it. We live in a world. We conform to different things in the world. Some of us like have conformed to watching football. Some of us have conformed to watching golf. I can't do that because I will fall asleep. Tennis, that's a little bit better. I still, I have a hard, chess is a sport, I think. That's hard to watch for a long time. I'm like, it can get kind of exciting, actually. I like playing chess. We conform to different tastes of things, like uh, food and cultures and even clothing and styles and fashion. We conform naturally because why? We, as human beings, we're drawn to becoming something. But here's the reality. God wants us to become like Christ while we live in this world. So we either conform to the ways of this world or we conform to the ways of God. And we know those ways by the life of Christ and the word of God. 
Okay, so he says without Christ, those, that's what's happening. And then again, under the influence and rule of Satan, without Christ, we are under the influence and rule or influence or inspiration and energy of Satan. Look at this Greek word at work is. I'm going back on purpose. I didn't make a mistake. <laughs> oh my goodness. At work right there in the Greek means energia. Literally means energize or energizing. To be without Christ is to be influenced, inspired, even used or energized by the devil. Wow, that's scary to think. That without Christ, you're susceptible to the influence of the devil. And whatever he wants to accomplish on earth, you're susceptible to it. But again, Paul is talking to a church who's been set free from that. That's, that's kind of scary to think. Then he goes on to say this. The fourth thing is you have a propensity to gratify cravings of the sinful nature, a tendency to give in to the sinful nature. Have you ever felt like you can't stop sinning? You have no control over that. You don't have to raise your hand, but just, you know what I'm saying? Like it's so hard to overcome maybe that addiction, that sin, whatever it could be. Well, we naturally have the propensity to do that. And I'll get to that next and why in the next scripture. But when I read this scripture in Ephesians 2, I thought immediately of Galatians 5. That we don't have to have that propensity or that tendency to sin because of the Holy Spirit in us. Galatians 5, 16 through 17 says, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. So if you, if you want to stop craving sin, you need something else to crave. Guess what God gives you? His spirit. Whatever is good to him, whatever is holy, whatever is right, you will crave if you are saved in Christ, if you are in a relationship with him. The sinful nature wants to do evil. That's just the way we are, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. The spirit doesn't want to do evil. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces, man, this is true. Anyone feel like, you can raise your hand on this one. Anyone feel like you're in a battle sometimes? going back and forth, and you're just struggling to win. Listen, it's, there's a few things we can do, like fasting, you know, praying, getting alone with God, denying our flesh. The reason why you fast food, uh, not fast, don't eat fast food. Um, the reason why you would fast food items, let's go with that, okay, or nourishment of, of some kind of form. The reason why you do that is because you deny your selfish desires to receive more of God when you pray and read your Bible during that time of fasting. So some of us can do that. But there are times where we try to do things um, that will never prevail, like staying away from certain foods are, is so hard to do, isn't it? Especially when you cook your kids nuggets and mac and cheese all the time. You're like, Lord, help me. Holy Spirit, help all you got to do sometimes is read the back of the box, though, and read the ingredients. You're like, oh, okay, never mind. And then you're like, why am I giving this to my kids, you know? <laughs> it's like, but it's so hard to resist the things of this world without a power source to help you, and that is God's presence. So he's saying here, these two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out. And, he, and in the Greek, he kind of does this, quote, unquote, good intentions. In other words, what you think is good the Holy Spirit is there to stop you from even giving in to those things you think is good because they're not necessarily holy, okay? Because the human nature, we have the wrong idea sometimes of what is good. Only what is good and holy is what, is what God says is good and holy. So he says there's sometimes the Holy Spirit has got to stop you from giving in. Now, here's the reality. This battle is only for those who have Christ in them, the Holy Spirit. Those who don't have Jesus in them, they have nothing to help stop them from giving in. That's scary. That used to be us. By the way, I titled this sermon, I'm not who I used to be. Praise God. I'm not that anymore. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came in and is helping me fight. Praise God. And the more we become aware that the Holy Spirit is in you to help you, the word convicted 
gets too often um, mis misconstrued and, and it makes you feel guilty and bad about yourself. But to be convicted by the Holy Spirit is the grace of God saying, look out, don't do that. That's love. That's not shame. That's what the devil does. That's the love of God saying, stay away from that. That's the Holy Spirit working in you. I'm nervous for people who don't have the Holy Spirit in them and they just give in to whatever they want. Because that used to be me. But I'm not who I used to be. You got to start saying that with me. Ready? I'm not who I used to be. All right, we'll, we'll practice that. <laughs> the fifth thing is we're subject to God's wrath or by nature, children of wrath. Well, that sounds really bad. But here's the thing. Sin has to be punished. God is a just God. And the reason why all of humanity is an object of God's wrath, in other words, where his wrath is going to head is because of sin. But if there's Christ in your life, that is not your destiny. But before Christ, it is your destiny. Why? Romans 5.12, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone for everyone sinned. That is the reality for all humans, all people without Jesus Christ. Because we're contaminated, polluted by sin. And God has to remove sin from earth to bring the new heavens and the new earth together. And it's only, that promise is only for those who believe in him. Now here's what's scary to me. Is these, these five things can almost be celebrated by our world. And yet we as believers realize this is really bad for our world. And I don't look at myself and go, I'm better than people. I read this and I go, man, I want people to have Jesus Christ in their life. Because that is not good. To, have, to, ha to not have Christ, those are the five things you have to be concerned about. And I pray today that you would see that. But here's the thing. Those of us who have believed in Jesus, those are five things we've been set free from. Now, listen to me, it's flatlined at this point, according to the scripture. Flatlined. There's no heart rate or heartbeat. There's, there's nothing. It's game over. There's no more time on the clock. The situation is bad for humanity. And then Paul uses two words that have changed everything, that mean everything has changed. Do you know what he says? It's in verse four. But God. Can I say it with me? But God. Say it out loud. Those two words mean so much. You could look at scripture throughout, throughout the entire Bible and see these words. They're at the, the Jordan River. They're at the Red Sea. They're trapped. But God. God is so rich in mercy and he loved us so much that even though we were dead, spiritually gone, flatlined, helpless, because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. That's why Easter is going to be exciting. We're going to celebrate on Easter. We celebrate every Sunday, by the way. We can, Sunday, Sunday is a day in, in Christianity to celebrate what God has done. Amen. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Paul turns the tide here and he goes, but this is your reality because you believed in Jesus. What we see here is as God's love led to mercy on us. When you see some helpless, my wife and I, we were walking in our neighborhood and we saw this helpless little tiny turtle. And your heart just wants to melt for that little thing because it's dry. It was this summer. It's just dry and it's dying in the middle of this road. And so what did we do? We picked it up and, and we brought it to the pond back into the water in our neighborhood. And I don't know if it survived or not, but my heart broke for that little helpless tiny baby turtle. And it was the cutest little thing. It was so cute. <laughs> when God sees you, you're not a turtle. 
You're a little better than that. Okay? He has mercy on you. He picks you up out of your condition and brings you to life. That's what Jesus did. Now, here's the thing about that. We were dead, helpless, and deserving of judgment, but God says we're worth saving. I want to illustrate something for you real quick. I am, I look properly dressed and clean, at least I think. I'm presentable. This is how we think. This is what we have to be like for God to save us and to accept us. But the reality is this is the way that God saves us and accepts us. We're dirty. We're broken. We're torn. We're ashamed. We're hurt. We're guilty. We're depressed. We're lost. We're a mess. We're ashamed. This is the condition that God says, I love you in. This is the condition you're in. And God goes, I've done something amazing for you. He didn't wait for you to get cleaned up to love you. Romans 5, 8 says this, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Can someone get a little excited in here? Because that is amazing. Remember, but God, Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. This is how he took me. He wanted to, he, I, I can't, I have to realize I'm broken. I think about it this way. If, if there was two products in the store and one is, they're both identical, but one is destroyed and broken and one is, is totally ready to be used and, and useful and worth something, and the other one's just destroyed in its package, which one would you pick? God picks the broken one. He picked you. He said, I died for you. That one's already good. It's time to fix this one. This one still has a purpose. Let me get that one and make it right. That's why Jesus came. That's what Paul is trying to say here. And then he doesn't even stop there. Paul goes on to say this. We shared life with Christ. Everything that Jesus experienced, we experience. Like, anyone feel unworthy of that in this room? I don't feel worthy to receive the same benefits or blessings that Jesus has gotten. Jesus was risen again. He was made alive. Guess what? So am I. Raised up with Christ. I'm raised up with Jesus? I'm near him? Am I really worthy of that? And then I'm seated with Christ. He's on a throne in the heavenlies. There's people, there's, there's cherubims and angels and, and weird looking creatures up there singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty to Jesus. Why in the world am I seated up there with him? Are we getting it yet? All because of two words and what they mean, but God. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Wow. And then why? Paul doesn't stop. Why would he do that? Why would he seat us with Christ? Why would he raise us up out of sin so that God can point to us? Wait, what? I'm an example? I, 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 I'm worth something to the point that, that God looks to me to, to show the world something of value? Come on, church. I'm talking about you today and me. God, why did he do this? So God could point to us? Let that sink in for a moment. Sometimes we read the Bible, we read it too fast. I'm trying to teach us how to read the Bible a little bit through this series, and I slow, when I read this, I get stuck right here. I get stuck right there because I'm just, I worship God as soon as I read that. I can't help but just be in my house Read, uh, worshiping God because God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of his grace and kindness toward us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Those who are in Christ, he has done this so that 
he can point to us and say, this is my grace and my love. Full demonstration right here. And it reminds me of what Paul says to his, to his uh, and by the way, this is incredible. We are like trophies and works of art displaying God's amazing grace. It's interesting, the Greek here talks about like, you're, you're this special item, this special person on display. And so the only thing we can think of in the English is like trophies or works of art. That's the only way we can really explain how special you are to God. I want you to say something real quick. I'm special to God. Man, we, we beat ourselves up. We say so many things bad about ourselves, but I'm special to God. I'm on display for the world to see God's grace. In other words, you're a victory on display. Yes, you're a win on display. God won and he puts you on display. You won infinity to zero. You beat the devil. You didn't. Jesus did, right? And God put you up and said, that's how amazing I am. That's how gracious I am. That's why we can't take credit for it. And, And Paul's about to get into that. You can't take credit for this. I did this for you and now I want the world to see it. And this is what Paul says to his to his understudy, Timothy. He says, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Wow. Mm. That's amazing. And some of you are probably going, hey, I can actually compete with you there, Paul. I'm the worst of sinners, all right? Well, guess what? Then God wants to use your story to show how amazing his love is. Are you seeing where Paul's headed here? There's a progression in this scripture. We're going from, we're doomed. Flat line, no heart rate, no heartbeat, nothing. Get the paddles out, spiritually. And all of a sudden, because of God, now we're a display of his grace. We're dusted off and put back on the shelf. We're shined up. I mean, my goodness, this is a beautiful scripture. And this is what we receive because of God. So we're getting the last few verses. It says this, but God saved you by his grace when you believed. Notice that we receive the grace through belief. So here's the way he saves us by his grace. We obtain it through faith. So we must receive this gift. We must believe in this gift of grace. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. Oh, yeah. You didn't have perfect church attendance to be saved. Oh, you didn't read the entire Bible without missing a day and that's what saved you. That's not how it works. You didn't pray perfectly and that's why you were saved. In fact, you didn't get yourself together and that's why you were saved. You know what we do? I do the laundry in my house. Did you guys know I do the laundry in my house as well? My wife does it more than me. Sorry, sorry, honey. Didn't mean to say it like that. I also do the laundry in my house. She uses the washing machine. You know what I use? I use this Tide marker. It takes a little longer, but it, it works, I think. I'm just kidding. I really don't do that. You know what we do? Jesus is walking in. God's walking in. We're, we're waiting for him to show up to save us. And this is what we do. We try to clean ourselves real quick. Ah, oh, let, let me get acceptable. Let me get clean. That's what we try to do. We're nervous that he's not going to accept us. We're nervous that he'll never love us. We're nervous that we're not worthy, so I'm gonna clean myself up. I'm gonna wash myself. Listen, no, no, no. He loved you and saves you through Jesus Christ. The work has been done. You just actually have to believe now that it's been done and you are washed. Then you are washed. And I'm telling you, your old life, the five things that your life without Christ was is gone That's not you anymore. I'm not who I used to be. Say it. I'm not who I used to be. Praise God. 
so we can't clean ourselves up because that's actually not the condition he saves you in. He saves you in the condition of brokenness. That's good. It's after salvation, then you want to live a good life. Why? Out of respect and joy and thanksgiving for the cost and the price of his blood. Because while I was standing here broken, what happened was Jesus walks down and stands in my place where I deserve that wrath and that judgment. In other words, when Jesus comes down and says, I'm accepted, you know what Jesus did over 2,000 years ago? He stayed there to take the cross for me. He said, you can go. You're free. Walk away. You are a new creation in me. I'm taking your sin for you. I didn't sin, but I'm taking it for you. That's how much God loves you. That's what he did for us. And when you believed, you received that salvation. Wow. Now, here's the thing. What does salvation mean? It's more than just salvation from sin. Salvation includes deliverance from sin, from the ways of the world, from the dominion and rule of Satan, and from the wrath of God. That's a whole lot more than just I'm free of my sin. The devil doesn't have domain over you anymore. Jesus does. Mm Mm-hmm. The wrath of God, that is not your future destiny. I don't have to live like the world and conform to the world. I can live like Christ. And then salvation isn't fully complete yet. What needs to be done so far has been done, but there's actually three stages. There's the past and what Christ has done for us on the cross. We're living the present with the Holy Spirit to identify us as his child. The Holy Spirit comes in and identifies us as saved. But then lastly, we receive new bodies and resurrected at the return of Christ. In other words, you're going to see and experience full salvation. You are saved, but at the same time, there's more to be done, and that's your body will no longer be an issue for you. Not just sin-wise, but even physical things. Praise God. What does this mean? We are God's supreme demonstration of grace. If the resurrection is God's supreme demonstration of power, We are his supreme demonstration of grace. You are, and he wants the world to see it. And here's what he said in the last verse. This verse alone deserves its own message. So I apologize for that in in advance. I I would love to teach on this as a whole, but we're going to get into it more as we go into Ephesians 4. But it says this, for we are God's masterpiece He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Paul ends this journey with this amazing scripture. The word masterpiece or workmanship in the Greek is poema or poem. In other words, you're a work of art. You're poetry to God. You're a beautiful piece of poetry. That's how God sees you. And you're created when you give your life to Christ. You're a new creation. Why? Because long ago, God had a plan to use you or to your life to help be a part of his mission to change the world. We're talking about complete transformation here, church. I, I mean, we're talking about we were dead and now we are useful in God's hands. We were broken and now we're fixed and now we can make a difference in our world. I'm excited about that. And that was God's plan long ago was to help you become this person in his kingdom to do amazing things with him. So we also get to share in his work, in his mission on earth. Praise the Lord. Look at first, or 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. That's who you are in Christ, a new creation. And then Titus 2, 14, he gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. That's right. His power is so effective. His salvation, his grace is so good that he has cleansed you and made you whole. And now you're able to do 
good things for his kingdom. Now, the first service, they got a little excited. I'm wondering if the 11 o'clock will get a little excited about this next part too. You ready? And if you wanna stand, you can stand. I'm gonna share some declarations about your life because of but God and what he's done. You can stand if you want. We're gonna worship a little bit too. If you wanna get excited, you can praise God because this is who you are now because of God. And then I got some declarations for you who are not saved yet, have not accepted this. Now listen to this. Let's practice, ready? I'm not who I used to be. Do you believe that? Salvation in Christ is you are not who you used to be. Now listen. I was dead, but now I'm alive. I was guilty by nature, but now I'm innocent by grace. I was the reason for God's wrath, but now I'm the reason for God's love. That is the reality today. I was stuck in the pit of sin, but now I'm raised and seated with Christ. Praise God. I was in that pit. I was broken and useless, but now I have purpose in this world because of Jesus Christ. I was a mess, but now I'm a masterpiece. Come on. Praise God for that. I was lost in this world, but now I will follow Christ. That is your reality. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not going to be who I used to be. I'm going to be who I'm called to be. I'm going to be what Jesus Christ has done for me. I'm not going to let it be in vain what Jesus has done the cross for me. I'm going to live out the purpose that God had for my life before I was even born. He called me to do good works. He called me. He saved me. That is your destiny. Now listen, if you, if you have, like, for every lie that Satan has, for, for even believers, but every lie Satan has, for you unbelievers. I got a buck God for every single one, but we have to leave today at some point. So I won't, I'll only give you a few. And if you're watching online, if you're in this room today, there is something that God has done for everything Satan says he won't do or you are not able to do. And listen to this. I'm too far gone, but God leaves the 99 for the one. That's you, the one who doesn't feel it. I'm too broken, but God makes all things new. But God, I've done too much, but God's grace has done more. I got one for every single one, don't worry. I can't let go, but God has more than you could ever imagine. I can't let go of that stuff. I can't let go of it. Yes, you can. God's got more. Wait a minute, I've got more. I've tried to change but God does the changing. So surrender to God. Let him change you today. I can't stop doing that. Okay, let God help you stop. I'm chained to my sin, but God sets the captive free according to scripture. Come on, praise God. Oh, this is, oh, this one, I hear this a lot. I'll mess it up, so I'm not even gonna start. But God's love doesn't give up. Come on, how many excuses are we gonna have? How many lies are we gonna believe that the devil has said and they're not even true? He's the father of lies. This is the truth of God's word. This is what he has for you if you do not believe in Jesus yet. If you have not accepted what Jesus has done for you, this is what he thinks of you. He's like, but me, I'm here. I'm alone. No, you're not. No, you're not because I gave Jesus Christ to come and dwell with you. I'm Emmanuel, God with you. You're not alone. You're not hopeless because I am hope. <sighs> Praise God. Praise God. Now listen, I'm going to go right back. I'm not making a mistake. I, I promise. 
God restored us not only to display, but also to express his grace to our world. See, Paul didn't even stop. He just, to the last line of verse 10, he keeps going. And what he's trying to say is, is you're not just a piece of art on a wall. You're a walking influence in this world. You are an extension of God's grace. When you show love and kindness and share the gospel and the truth with people, you are not just a display. You are the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. That's how worthy you are now. Praise the Lord. Wow. So today, if we can close our eyes, church, we can be praying because we had multiple salvations in the first service. This is what Jesus has done for you. I don't have to be like that old life. God is calling people right now. God is working on hearts to believe in what he's done already on the cross. Is that you? Have you been making up a bunch of reasons why God isn't madly in love with you? Because he is. Have you believed that God has given up on you? He hasn't. Have you believed that you'll never be loved and accepted? It's not true. He wants you to come to him today and say, I believe that you've done this for me. I believe you love me. I believe I'm a new creation in Christ. When I put my faith in Jesus, I'm a new creation. If that's you, would you pray with us right now? You can repeat after me. Heavenly Father, dear God, thank you for what you've done for me on the cross. Forgive me. I know I'm forgiven. I believe I'm forgiven now. I see how you deliver me. And I receive this free gift. Even in this condition I'm in, I receive it. I am worthy to receive it. And you love me. Change my heart. Transform my life. I will follow you and do what you've prepared for me to do. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed anything like that from your heart, we want to know. We want to know. You got to tell an usher on the way out or a greeter or a friend. We have stuff to help you. We have resources to help you. But we want to celebrate as well. And then we as a church, we want to give our hearts to God. Can we sing a little bit? Because for me, as a believer, I'm just encouraged I'm encouraged by what I'm reading again. I'm reminded because we can forget. And I believe that we need to give our hearts to God so that we will live our lives for him. Amen. That's what he wants. He wants our whole heart. And so we're going to sing that right now just to worship him. There's only one way to respond to that amazing grace. It's to worship him with our lives. But we'll start right now with worshiping with our, our mouths and our hands being lifted up and our postures of worship right now. So God, we come to you and worship you. You can have our hearts today. You've had them. We renew that you have them again. We're captivated by your love. You get our whole life, not just a portion of it. We worship you today. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God.